for our first episode in a while for Sincerely Yours. This is Ibrahim Hindi. I'm with Sheikh Abdullah Duro. Sheikh, Sheikh, how are you doing? I'm good. Alhamdulillah. Happy, healthy. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. It's been a minute. Alhamdulillah. Allah is very kind. Alhamdulillah. So what have you been up to for the past... Uh, it's been a couple months now. <laughs> yeah, just you know, just just staying busy. Alhamdulillah, just staying real busy. Alhamdulillah. Keeping my family busy, the boys busy. You know, a lot of projects and stuff like that. So with I'm in school, so we're in the second semester. So got to lock down, lock in actually. So, alhamdulillah. <laughs> alhamdulillah. I saw you went to. Uh, you took a trip. During last uh, month. A couple months ago, yeah, I was Ghana. I went yeah, to Ghana. You went to Africa. Ghana, mash- mashallah. Yeah. How was that? Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, yeah, I got to see all of my family. I mean, I have my mother has like eleven brothers and sisters, so you can imagine how many cousins. Mashallah. It's a whole yeah. village. Yeah. It's a party. Yeah. And so, alhamdulillah. And, and so it was really, really beautiful. It was, I mean, it was for my grandmother's funeral, but um, it was, it was. I learned a lot of my history. I got to go to the museum and learn about the Ashanti culture and the Ashanti, the origin of it, and it was, it was very, very enlightening. So, mashallah. Plan to share it on my Instagram soon. Inshallah. <laughs> I got to meet some of the students from Medina that I, that I said, well, they were my mentors from Ghana. They were in their doctorate program. So went out to the village and got to interview them. And so it was, uh, it was a beautiful moment. That's really cool, Mashallah. Have some jollof while you're there. Oh, of course. Come on. Of course. Come on. Yeah, come on. Golden <laughs> standard, Shake. Come on. Come on. Now. It's better than the Nigerian one, right? It's, uh... This is my roof. Why we? This is like, this is my roof. This is well known. <laughs> I heard someone actually get into a fight about that, an argument about it, and I immediately thought about you. <laughs> <laughs> this is like Osin Khazar but you know, it's, yeah. I didn't like, realize this is like a long standing argument oh, Nigerian no. versus the Ghanaian. <laughs> Maruf, Maruf. It's, 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 yeah, you, you, you have to have your allegiance. Mashallah. It's like yeah. the Briani fights. <laughs> <laughs> the Briani fights. <laughs> oh, Mashallah. Wow, well, there should be an Instagram page for this stuff, you know. <laughs> There's already people in the comments like Nigerians are better <laughs> all the way. Oh wow. <laughs> I saw some of the comments on my page too. It's crazy. Beautiful. Uh, as always, we want to hear from all of you. Give us your salam. And, and also if you have any questions, inshallah, for our guests today, put them in the chat. We are going to take them be uh, if time permits, inshallah. So today we have a great guest uh with us, Dr. Nazar Khan is the president of Yaqeen Canada and the director of research strategy at the Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research. He is a neuroradiologist and assistant professor at McMaster University in Canada. He's also a specialist in the Quranic sciences with a certification and ijazah in the 10 readings of the Quran through both major and minor routes of transmission. He has also received other certifications in Quranic studies uh, in Ulum al-Quran, Hadith, and Aqidah, Islamic theology. He has memorized the whole Qur'an during his youth and served as an imam for many years. He has taught Islamic theology and Qur'anic studies classes, workshops, and seminars, and is a consultant for the Manitoba Islamic Fiqh Committee. Dr. Khan completed his residency at the University of Manitoba and fellowship in diagnostic diagnostic neuroradiology at the University of Calgary. It's a lot of long words. Uh, His expertise in both... um, Medical sciences and Islamic theology uniquely positions him to address challenging contemporary questions regarding faith, reason, and science. With that, uh, let's welcome Dr. Nazar Khan. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing good. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Great to have you. A little more Canada on the show. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) We should have have coordinated and met up and and just done it from one, uh, one camera. Then a little uh, like Sheikh Omar and Sheikh Abdullah pulled on the uh, on the Quran thirty for thirty. Yeah. yeah so, Doctor, uh, so Sheikh Abdullah, you should know. Doctor Nazar keeps inviting me to go swimming in this pool, and he has this idea. He keeps pitching it to me. Let's do sincerely yours in the pool. <laughs> Sheikh Abdullah will approve. He's the fitness guru. Anything fitness, Sheikh Abdullah will uh, will green light it. Exactly. I'll be clinging on to the side, trying to not fall in, and Shabba will be doing like backflips. As long as you don't break the mic, Aki. As long as we can hear you, everything yeah. is fine. I'll be alone. That's great. So, so much of sincerely yours is about uh, introducing people to the people of knowledge, and you know, help, help, helping people 
you know, break down the barriers between understanding, you know, the challenges that um, people face on their way to gain knowledge and also to feel relatable to the people of knowledge. So we like to like know your life story. And this is challenging because you and I have known each other subhanAllah since a long time. <laughs> I don't want to count the years. It feels like at least 15 years that we've known each other. It makes us feel old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but let me ask you, you know, the question we like to start off with, um, you know, when did you, when did you decide to pursue knowledge or when did, when did you make a decision? I'm a Muslim. Like this is your decision. Uh, I decide that this is a religion that I believe in, not just something my parents gave me. Right. Jazakum uh, That's a beautiful question. A beautiful place to begin. Um, so uh, growing up uh, as a young Muslim uh, in Canada, um, the importance of uh, our Iman as an identity was something that my parents instilled in me uh, from a young age. Uh, and I would say that they did it in, in two really important ways. One is that uh, truth matters. And the second is that actions matter. So with respect to the first, the fact that truth matters, what I grew up understanding about Islam is that Islam is not just a cultural identity. It's a worldview. It's an, uh, it, it, it is a description of the truth uh, uh, of reality, truth with a capital T. And when you love the truth, uh, you want to share that uh, with others, and it informs the way in which you uh, perceive the world. Um, so I grew up with a very da'wah-oriented perspective on seeking Islamic knowledge. Um, the first time that uh, you know I, I spoke about Islam and explained Islam to others was when I was in grade two, when I was seven years old, and my mother uh, helped me prepare a presentation to explain to the class what is uh, Eid about, what is Islam about, uh, because you know and I was going to a class uh, in a school. At that time, I was probably the only Muslim uh, in, in in the class, if not the school. Right? It was a, a predominantly a non-Muslim area, there was a lot of Islamophobic perception. I can remember uh, a lot of Islamophobic comments. And so um, at the age of seven, starting to uh, speak about Islam uh, to my classmates, like I had that that idea that we are ambassadors of, of our faith. And that was something instilled in me uh, from an early age. And that continued uh, later on getting involved in more da'wah organizations as well. Uh, and that really shaped uh, my my journey of seeking knowledge. The other thing I would say about um, my parental upbringing uh, was the emphasis on actions. Um, we know that, you know, in, in Islam, you know, early, early scholars of Islam emphasized the concept that iman is qawlun wa amal, right? That iman is uh, statements and actions. Uh, how we uh, believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should manifest itself in the way that we deal with others. And that was something that, uh, my mother uh, especially emphasized to us, uh, you know, growing up that our good character, our good conduct, our um, uh, striving to excel in knowledge and in all disciplines, this is a part of our deen. This is a part of what makes us Muslim is the striving for, for excellence, strive in, in all domains of life uh, and in the way that we interact with others. And the fundamental values of Islam are, uh, you know, uh, our duty and commitment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through caring for his creation. And that worldview really uh, shaped my, my journey and, and, and empowered me. Uh, so Islam as an identity was not just a cultural label. It was something that really empowered me uh, in, in all aspects of my life. And to this day, really uh, it inspires me, uh, not just in seeking knowledge, but in my career as a medical doctor, right, in, in all aspects of my life. So did, were, were you, I mean, you mentioned at the age of seven, uh, how was it when you started to, when you became a teenager, was there any times where you were conflicted with an instructor or a friend that possibly brought some level of doubt or was there a level of, for lack of better words, did you face within any of the communities that you were in where people would say that you, for lack of better words, culturally apostate, right? To where, okay. You know, you, you know, I found that when I was, you know, a new Muslim, I'd see a lot of youth uh, and they would be those that are trying to not a lot of youth, only chosen few, actually, that would try to study the knowledge. But there would be a conflict with their parents, with the community. Did you face any of that upon your teenage years? So Jazakallah Khair, that uh, brought to mind a, a few uh, interesting memories. So subhanAllah, in my high school years, 
um, at the time I was doing my uh, Quran, I was memorizing the Quran, uh, which I, I finished uh, when I was 19 years old. Uh, and uh, during my high school years, when I was memorizing Quran, I would go online and download recitation of the Quran. You know, initially we just had the CDs. And then when MP3 files came out, then it was like, okay, what are the websites I can go to? And, and you know, I remember looking for these uh, um, online websites that had imams of the Haramain recitation recordings. And the reason why I mentioned this is because on one uh, internet platform I, I, that I found some of those recordings, I also found there was a, a discussion forum. And in that discussion forum, uh, there were Muslims and non-Muslims debating about different topics. And I noticed that, you know, a lot of um, people were on that forum just listing allegation after allegation against Islam, right? And just making all these arguments against Islam. And for me as a, as a young Muslim uh, at the time, maybe 16 years old, that uh, really uh, shocked me that there was this level of, you know, animosity, this level of organized uh, Islamophobia, this level of like concerted efforts to try to uh, attack Islam and to um, instigate uh, doubts or a crisis of faith uh, in the hearts of, of Muslims, uh, uh, as you alluded to. And so I remember, you know, uh, just registering right away, making an account, and then consistently, almost on a daily basis, from, you know, age 16 till I graduated from high school, I was engaging in internet debates uh, with people from all different backgrounds. My parents were concerned. They're like, you, you, you're not spending any time on homework, you're coming home. You know, uh, you're skipping class to engage in debates about religion, oh. philosophy, and science, and all this kind of stuff. You know, and, and that's, but I was so passionate about it. And it goes back to what I mentioned earlier, truth matters, right? And when people are um, spreading misinformation, like that was something that I took uh, very personally. I'm like, I, I know the answer to this question. I got to do something about it. And then that also affected my journey of seeking knowledge because I see an allegation against the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and I have to go to the books of Sirah, right? And I see a statement against the Quran, this interpretation of this verse, and now I go to the books of Tafsir. So in the 90s, I pretty much exhausted the existing English literature on Islam. And then I realized I got to learn Arabic, right? I got to, I got to get more resources. And so... Um, as I said, like Dawah really shaped my my journey of, of, of seeking knowledge and specifically seeing the uh, context of Islamophobia, the context of Muslims undergoing a crisis of faith with a lot of misinformation being spread about uh, Islam. That definitely uh, inspired me to uh, to continue this this journey. Mm, subhanAllah. So so can imagine you in the social media age if there was social media back in in <laughs> Sheikh Nasser's day. I would have a different an alias name and just would have went to town on people. I, I did have an alias. Oh, name. Yeah, I won't, I won't reveal it, but <laughs> somebody, some clever person, is gonna like search it up and find like ten thousand posts from me, and all of a sudden, you know, they're gonna like start digging through things that I said when I was in high school. But um, maybe that's also why I'm not on social media because I experienced that amount of. Internet debates, uh, you know, so early on, and I, I experienced some positive of it. You know, it definitely had a profound effect on my own growth and in, in, in critical thinking and ability to respond and and just get to the root of the uh, the disagreement or the root of the objection or to see when people have an objection, what's really behind it. But at the same time, like it, it also showed me uh, a very pessimistic side of of social media and how some people are just interested in argumentation, and you could spend hours and hours and hours on the, sometimes the most basic thing uh, and it still won't convince a person. And the example I always give is that, you know, the I, uh, people who were flat earth theorists, people who believe that the earth was flat was actually an extreme minority until the rise of uh, social media and the rise of the internet. It caused this to come back and people were able to connect with others and follow these conspiracy theories and um, so as much as the internet is the age of information, it's even more the age of misinformation. Mm -hmm. Did you find yourself... Um, so th th these debates, were they only... Was it more of an... Inter not interfaith, but more with non-Muslims? Or was it even, you know, it, within Muslims that were, you know, people that claim that they're Muslim? Did you find that you had debates with them as well? 
or back? Yeah, in? both. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I would say the majority was with with people outside of the faith. Uh, some of them were not, uh, you know, hostile debates. Some people genuinely uh, wanted to learn about Islam and had some misconceptions. They came from all different backgrounds. Uh, Christian, Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, Sikhs. I, you know, some religions that I had only ever heard of or encountered on the internet. You know, and uh, I would, you know, be dialoguing with these people. And there, there were other people who um, were really were hostile and belligerent. And uh, sometimes a different style of debate w was needed to kind of expose their ignorance that they were using to launch their attacks. Uh, but with Muslims as well, yeah, there were people with different viewpoints, and I think. You know, one of the things that I benefited from is while I was reading these books and engaged in these debates, I also had mentors and, and teachers that I would go back to okay. um, because you need to have that guidance, right? And you need to have that tarbiya. Um, and so uh, when I would see people coming from different points of view, one thing that I appreciate is that my mentors also had uh, different viewpoints, right? And so they they were not all the same. They were not all, you know, homogenous. And it gave me that ability to to take the best from everyone. Uh, and have that kind of critical approach as well. So so let, let's unpack that because that's what I was going to allude to next was, did you find yourself drowning in this in these internet debates and getting involved? But then when you mentioned mentors, I mean, there are so many youth right now that are, mashallah, they're trying the best to practice religion, but they cannot let Islamophobia slide if it's on their screen or if they see some type of deviance from Muslims <laughs> You know, for instance, saying that I can be a mu'min and not pray, like we talked about al amal al right. of iman. Yeah. So, did you find yourself getting into a, a deep hole, and and some of your mentors kind of indirectly or directly pulled you out of it? Did you find that was that was that some something similar to what you faced in? in uh... Yeah, I, I would say that um, there was potential for that. There was mm -hmm. definitely potential for me to uh, go down the path of confusion if I didn't have you know, mentorship that was that was really great, you know, and very beneficial. And, you know, that's the important part of our dean to be connected back to scholars, not to be somebody who's self-taught. Right. And so um, and that's something, you know, I, I can pursued uh, Islamic classes. That's how I met Sheikh Ibrahim. We started mm -hmm. attending a lot of the same classes together and uh, pursuing one-on-one uh, -on -one instruction as well with uh, the shiuch. Um it, whatever I would see on the internet, whatever I would uh, encounter in my debates and discussions, I would write down a list of questions. And the next time I knew a, a major scholar was visiting Toronto, I would be one of the people who would be in, in class with a list of questions. And people used to be like, you know, like, leave the sheikh alone, you know, I'd be <laughs> following him, you know, after the break, after lunch, after dinner with all these questions. Um, but later I realized, you know, I think that's something that really helped me because, um, Abdullah ibn Abbas, عنهما, when he was asked yeah. about how you gain knowledge, he said, right? Being with the inquisitive tongue uh, and a, a comprehending mind. And so um, asking a lot of questions from, from qualified teachers and, and, and deferring to people uh, who are more knowledgeable, I think that's so important. And one of the biggest uh, fitness I see online now is people don't want to defer to those who are senior in knowledge, right? People go online mm. and all that's it. They're Sheikh al-Islam. <laughs> they answer a few <laughs> debates here and there. And now they're dishing out on every single topic, every topic, right? SubhanAllah. So that's that's one of the issues as well. Yeah, yeah I was just contrasting that in my mind, like you on these late 90s message boards <laughs> responding to people versus like today, I mean, I see a lot of the youth and they're on TikTok and they're on Instagram and they're trying to respond to people today as well. But there seems to be like negative aspects of it, of that kind of like ref refutation response culture. Even when sometimes they're responding to like missionaries or people who are distorting Islam. Like you said, one issue is they're not necessarily going back to scholars. Um, are there other things that you feel like is lacking in, in this space today that maybe you know, didn't exist in the past. Things that are, are lacking on uh, social media uh, currently. Yeah, like in this whole culture, like, yeah. are they are we dumbing down the discourse versus in the past? Yeah, so really there's a that. there's an interesting article um, that was uh, that I, I I saw recently, uh, not too long ago, which was talking about. Um, why the past 10 years of, uh, of American history have been uniquely stupid, 
Okay. And what the article was arguing is that uh, they traced it back to the invention of the like button on, on Facebook and the retweet button on, on Twitter. And they were arguing that the way social media is set up, the, the actual uh, machinery of, of social media is set up in a way that things go viral um, depending on how outrageous the content is, right? So you're, you try to express a very polarized opinion uh, a very hostile opinion. You have to go onto Twitter with, with all your rage and, and be mad about something in order for it to go viral, right? And so mm -hmm. um, if you're out there just talking about like, you know, cl clarifying misconceptions, establishing some usul in the deen, just, you know, saying some very normal stuff, it's not going to go viral. You're not going to get a lot of followers. So in a way, social media is set up uh, in a way that brings out the worst qualities of, of, of people. Um, and subhanAllah, you know, as, as uh, part of my, uh, I think I've mentioned to you, uh, Sheikh Ibrahim, before, that I'm, I'm doing this uh, PhD in Islamic theology uh, at University of Nottingham. Uh, and this, uh, one of the parts that I'm, I'm looking at is um, how scholars talked about actually yaqeen, actually certainty, certainty mm -hmm. and knowledge. And um, looking at Ihya uh, Ulum al of uh, Imam uh, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali in Kitab al-Ilm, he talks about this problem. And if you look at some of his statements, you're like, man, this is so applicable today. Like, it's like he's describing the social media generation about how people are so invested in their image and in, uh, in their disputes and in argumentation. And they're not even paying attention to um, gaining knowledge or the truth in, in their, the words of their opponent, they just want to try to prove their own point. And the whole mm -hmm. uh, social media machinery is really the cult of the self, the worship of the nafs, right? And it's just bringing that out more and more in people because it's all about, this is how many followers I have. This is my image. This is who I mm -hmm. am on social media. I'm an influencer, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, unfortunately it brings out the worst, subhanAllah. SubhanAllah. So, so, so when you, when you, um, I mean, you mentioned how you, I'm, and I remember those days. I think maybe one, one other thing that you, uh, want, I want to mention is that I remember the days where it was. I remember the days. Wow. Where, <laughs> <laughs> I remember the days. We did a flyer. It'd be the paper flyer hung up in the masjid, and it's going to be like a conference, a weekend conference. Remember those weekend conference yeah, days yeah. where, and then the sheikh would come down and he'd have the table in the masjid, and it'd be Friday night, Friday, Friday night. If you're from the Khawas, you get to go to the brother's house and sit with the sheikh and ask all your questions. And then right. Saturday's the Dora and me and like the Islamic full day uh, intensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he leaves on Sunday. But it was just like the barakah of the masjid. So with, with you, when you had from you, you mentioned you had questions you would ask the sheikh. And you said that you wanted to learn Arabic because you fully exhausted all the English resources. How was that transition from, you know, I've read a lot of English now I to get further deeper into the knowledge it's got to be Arabic. So what did you do at that moment? Yeah, so uh, initially, uh, when I was, uh, you know, pursuing uh, knowledge, um, what I was doing is while I was memorizing the Quran, um, I was learning Arabic through the Quran. Uh, I never took any Arabic courses, never uh, attended any uh, classes. Uh, I kind of did it the hard way, right? And But um, with respect to the Quran, it's, it's the easy way, right? So uh, as I was memorizing the Quran, uh, I would focus on trying to understand the meanings uh, of the words using sarf, right? Using the morphology of the words. So you learn three letters and all of a sudden you can make so many different words out of it, right? Uh, and so understanding those principles behind the Arabic language allows you to rapidly learn a lot. And when you understand the Quran well, then the next thing that I would look at is uh, works of tafsir in Arabic. And I would, because I knew I wouldn't get lost if I'm reading a paragraph in, in tafsir and, and, and reading uh, the verse, I know what the, what the, the paragraph is explaining. Um, and I used to start to listen to Arabic lectures. Uh, when I was listening to Arabic lectures, initially maybe I would understand uh, 40% uh, of the lecture, just purely based on this kind of book study that I had done before, uh, using dictionaries and translations and whatnot. Uh, but if you keep doing that after listening to maybe like 500, 600 lectures in Arabic, your brain starts to automatically 
habituate itself to to the language. And subhanAllah, this is the brain is amazing how it rewires itself, right? That neuroplasticity of the brain. You just constantly expose yourself to that language and there's all this subconscious learning that's happening, right? It's recognizing mm -hmm. where words are used. And so by this kind of immersion into listening uh, to Arabic lectures, uh, reading the works of tafsir, uh, and, and not giving up initially, uh, and, and, and then going back to mentors and, and, and teachers to, to, to get further clarification, that's how I, I gradually made that transition um, uh, to, to then doing all of my research in Arabic resources, right? And not even going back to the English resources. MashaAllah. So let me ask you, because I think a lot of people would just give up when they hit that wall of like, oh, I don't know Arabic, so I'm just going to stop. Mm -hmm. And I'll go back to like maybe the way that you were raised, because, uh, you know, maybe people don't know, but mashallah, you're, both of your parents are doctors. And your brother, mashallah, is a successful surgeon. Your sister is very active, mashallah, in da'wah herself. Uh, so it seems like your parents really got all of you guys to have high ambitions. And you had this ambition of like, giving da'wah and gaining knowledge. And when you hit like a wall of, okay, everything I need to know now is only in Arabic, you still have the ambition to learn Arabic and to go even further. Uh, how did you get that ambition? How did your parents put that in you? And and I know you were going to bring it up at some point, mashallah, your new father. So when you look at your son, uh, how are you thinking of getting that ambition in them? Yeah, mashallah. That's a that's a really deep question, and um, it goes back to an important principle in our, in our deen, which is ardu al himma, right? Having high aspirations, and you're absolutely right that this is something that uh, my parents uh, instilled in us. And I would actually, in addition to my parents, I would also add uh, my grandparents. So my my maternal grandparents, uh, alhamdulillah, uh, may Allah have mercy on both of them, who passed away, you know, in the recent years. Um, I had a very close relationship uh, with them, and I had the opportunity to come accompany them on Umrah uh, maybe like four or five times, alhamdulillah. And during my childhood, you know, they played a, a really important role. So I would remember as a young child um, uh, going, uh, uh, seeing my uh, grandmother doing uh, lectures to, to a group of sisters over the phone. And uh, I would be asking her, what was your topic about? And I, uh, she would explain it to me afterwards. And, you know, at that time when I was a kid, um, we have these home videos because my, my parents got my older brother. Well, you know, those camcorders back in the day were like this big. So my older brother was, you know, like this small kid carrying around this massive camcorder, taping, re recording everyone's waste, right? <laughs> Running around the house. And, uh, but there's one video where he's recording my uh, grandmother teaching me how to make dua. And um, she's, uh, which is something really interesting. And she's uh, explaining to me in the video, you hear me saying, you know, uh, you know, Ya Allah, you know, uh, uh, make the poor people rich. And like this is kind of a kid's version of a, a dua, but it's, it's still, you know, beautiful. I'm saying make the, make the poor people rich and uh, make me into a, a doctor. And I was probably like six years old or, or younger at this time. And my grandmother, you hear her say, uh, you shouldn't just want to be a doctor of deen. You should, uh, you should be, sorry, you shouldn't just want to be a doctor of dunya. You should also want to be a doctor of deen. And, and her teaching me to say, you know, make me, make me a doctor and an imam, right? And so you would think that that kind of instruction that a, a grandparent tells their kid at age six, it would have like no lasting effect. Yet here I am, right? And that, that those aspirations were something that I really internalized and it meant a lot to me. Um, and it, it shaped my worldview and it shaped the view of what I want to contribute in the world. And so um, to answer that question about where does that ulu al himma come from, it comes from our dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you really understand the power of, of dua, um, what do you want to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, right? If you have nothing to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, you're aiming for nothing in life. If you have if you have lofty ambitions, you will find that manifested in the du'as that you make to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's amazing. You made that as a kid. <laughs> Allah accepted it. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So from there, so so you 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 went on this journey of learning Arabic through the Quran and then continuing the journey. I mean, till now we all are. 
of you know learning the Arabic language and uh, reading reading the, the transition from English resources to Arabic resources to Arabic sources, excuse me, uh, and learning. It. When did you start to give to the community? Like when was your first khutbah, your first class? How did you feel? Were you nervous? Yeah, mashallah. So first uh, Jumar khutbah that I, I gave, I used to give it at high school. And there was just like yeah. maybe five, six of us who are Muslims in, in the high school that I went to. And like oh, now, wow. if you if you talk about the greater Toronto area, that's like every single school has, you know, tons of Muslims. But the high school that I attended, you know, uh, predominantly uh, white neighborhood, uh, very few uh, colored pe people of color and, and very few Muslims in particular. And I remember those khutbahs like, and maybe because it was that relaxed setting, uh, I'd ask the guys before when they'd walk in, I'd be like, what do you guys want to hear about for the khutbah? Right? <laughs> <laughs> just kind of like suggest topics. I'm like, okay, yalla, let's talk about this, right? And I give it, I could do, start doing the khutbah. And at the time, like I, I just read like, uh, you know, one small uh, book of a fifth that had been translated about the fifth of the Juma Khutbah. I got the basics done. Uh, and then when I went to uh, start my undergraduate studies at McMaster University, that's when I started to do uh, halakas. Uh, and that's also when, you know, um, I was surrounded by a group of other, uh, you know, brothers who were very passionate about the, the deen as well. Um, and in fact, uh, the house that we uh, used to live at, uh, just off campus, people nicknamed it Fatwa House because it was a, <laughs> a group of, of brothers who were, they were like, oh man, these hardcore brothers, they're just talking about Deen and Fatawa. This is a Fatwa House, right? So, um, but that was, that was something that uh, really showed me how studying the Deen is something that is enjoyable. It is fun, right? It is, uh, it's invigorating. Um, and that was, that was when I started to give uh, halaqahs at, at the university. Um, yeah, exactly. So what did what did you teach? So, so this is throughout your whole your your four, your four years in college. I'm assuming, right? You were doing giving halakas. You were part of the MSA. Were you the president of MSA? Yeah. Or? I wasn't the president of the MSA. I went from uh, like public relations external first dawah booth coordinator, public relations external, and then like senior advisor. <laughs> so I I just. Uh, had more of a, a, a role always in the Islamic education side of things and the da'wah side of things. Um, the first halaqa series that I gave at McMaster, and people who are from McMaster will remember this, um, it, it was entitled Ark. And it was, I chose the title based on the statement of Imam Malik, a sunnah mithlu safinati nuh, man rakibaha naja wa man takhallafa anha halak. Right? The sunnah is, is like the Ark of Noah, Whoever embarks upon the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad was so, saved, uh, and whoever uh, abandons it uh, perishes. And so um, the entire halaqa series was about exploring the concept of the sunnah, uh, sunnah in its broadest sense, not just in terms of hadith transmission, preservation of hadith, but sunnah also as a theological concept, sunnah as uh, a concept in, in, in our aqidah, sunnah as a concept in usul al din right? As, as uh, masadir al tashriya right? The sources of Islamic legislation. So studying that uh, concept uh, in comprehensively, and I, I deliberately kind of had some marketing te techniques as well to make it enticing to, uh, to, uh, to youth, to university students. So the poster just said ARC, and we had like some video trailer that we filmed at that time. Wow. And uh, and we have we used to make some crazy uh, MSA tr videos at that time, and uh, mashallah, it was it brought together people who uh, many of them are are still, still involved in Islamic dawah in some shape or form. Mashallah, mashallah, that's great, mashallah. So that continued all the way on to I mean not the art class, but I mean yeah. just continuously teaching throughout college. Yeah, so uh, exactly. So dur during undergraduate and medical school, I uh, would be doing that on, on the side. Uh, and then uh, when I graduated from medical school, I, um, I started my residency uh, in radiology in Winnipeg. So I lived in Winnipeg for five years. Okay. Uh, and uh, Winnipeg is like in the middle of nowhere <laughs> for a geographic <laughs> reference for people who don't know where Winnipeg is. Like oh, wow. literally like right in the middle of North America. Um, but... Uh, 
uh, in Winnipeg, Masha, I was in a smaller Muslim community. I had the chance to get involved in a lot of activities that I didn't have the chance to uh, before. And like, all kinds of things. Like in Winnipeg, I was involved in, um, you know, doing uh, uh, talks with between Muslims and, and Christian neighbors at the church, uh, doing... Um, you know, uh, uh, introductory Islam classes to the uh, police station, to police cadets, you know, doing, uh, doing uh, in, intro to Islam uh, or stuff about uh, end of life care to healthcare mm -hmm. workers, all sorts of different things. And then in addition to that, doing their Eid khutbah uh, in Winnipeg, where, you know, people from all over Manitoba uh, would come, uh, the province of Manitoba come together in, in Winnipeg. So we had, mashallah, like a huge congregation. Um, but also at that time in, in Winnipeg, I was studying intensively on the side with um, uh, a scholar who I met when I first moved there, uh, Sheikh Ammar Khatib. And I've kept that studying since leaving Winnipeg till today. I still meet with him once a week, right? You know, I still do my, my classes with him. So I've studied with him now for, for 10 years. And uh, the, the knowledge is, of course, beneficial, but also the relationship, the tarbiyah, the mentorship relationship is, is something that, you know, you can't, you can't uh, take for granted. Um, so it's it's something that I, I, I really uh, treasure that ability to hold on to, to good mentors. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. All right, Sheikh, it's time to <clears throat> get into our rapid fire questions. Okay, we take some questions from the audience. Bismillah. So those of you in the audience, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. And after this session, we'll, um, we'll turn to your questions, inshallah. So let's start off easy. Okay. As we normally do. <laughs> right. Do you prefer the spring or the fall? The spring or the fall? I like the fall weather. Yeah, there's something about the fall that I like. Going hiking, changing of. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, after living in Calgary, uh, that's when uh, I lived in Calgary for two years during my fellowship. And you really experience the outdoors that we have the Rockies, the Canadian Rockies, uh, beautiful nature. And so you really start to get. Uh, connected with that through hikes. Yeah, all right, pancakes or waffles? <laughs> pancakes or waffles, Sheikh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This is, you know, there's this concept called decision fatigue where you yeah, told me about that. that are so like <laughs> meaningless that <laughs> they just take up your, your brain space. You got to save your brain power for some more important decisions. <laughs> let's say, let's say pancakes. Then. Chocolate right. chip or <laughs> more consequential, a book or a podcast? A uh, book, definitely. But uh, podcasts, I, 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 I used to listen to them on my drives uh, to work. Now I have a much shorter commute. Um, so I often listen to podcasts uh, at the gym, actually. And, mm -hmm. uh, and what I've also found is that in Arabic, there's more audiobooks that are available of like some really important works. Uh, uh, so recently I was listening to Ibn al-Qayyim's Adda' uh, wa-Dawa in audiobook uh, at the huh. gym, just listening to that. And it's amazing. You, you can get through so much, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, wow. yeah, so that's uh, that's what I have started doing. And I've, I found that very beneficial. So it's a nice shift. When I'm at home, I'm reading books. And then, you know, if I'm, if I'm in the car or at the gym or something, I'm uh, listening to podcasts or audiobooks. Nice. Okay, who would you want to have dinner with, but you can't choose the prophet, any of the prophets or the companions? Okay, so I I want to have dinner with you, Sheikh. Like, why, <laughs> how, come, how come it's so hard to meet up? We're both in Toronto. Like, <laughs> you, you had dinner with me. It's, <laughs> it's not all cracked. It's not what it's all cracked up to be. What about Sheikh Abdullah? When, he, when is he coming to uh, to Toronto? <laughs> I don't know. Good question. The, trying, trying to bring him here. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, no, mashallah. I think one of the things being involved in Yaqeen is has really blessed us with is having uh, being connected to such an amazing uh, team of, of individuals, of, of scholars, researchers, and 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 people contributing in all different shapes and forms, not just scholarship and research. Um, and so, I've I, it's one of the biggest blessings that I've appreciated that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has has given us through working with Yaqeen is just that uh, the, the friendships and those uh, close relationships and being able to benefit from others uh, in the Institute. Um, so I, I don't know if you want to, if you want a historical <laughs> figure, I could give you one, but I think, uh, mashallah, the, the contemporary figures I, I, keep me occupied too with dinners. 
I thought you were gonna say like Ibnte Mia. I'm like <laughs> I was gonna be like <laughs> just gonna be my PhD so I H- help you finish that PhD quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would and there's definitely a lot uh, one could ask uh Sheikh Hassan Ibn Taymiyyah. But you know what is even more interesting is asking some of the scholar like having a meeting with a scholar whose works we we don't have as many of their works. So like some of the early mm. scholars where you just wonder like, oh, you know, how did they view this particular issue? Um, there's many uh, amazing, uh, incredible scholars in Islamic history that you'd want to sit down with, especially in the first uh, three generations and and just get their insights on something like someone like Imam Sufyan Thodi, right? Just an incredible mm. individual, right? A very uh, eccentric uh, personality, what a person to sit down with, right? Like it would be so interesting to sit down with some of these scholars. Okay, less consequential questions. Yeah. As a kid, what was your favorite cartoon? <laughs> I, like, I don't know. <laughs> then I have the other question. I'm like, the, the real that? as a kid, the real answer is Darkwing Duck. Do you know that cartoon? <laughs> Vaguely. That. Darkwing Duck, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The was cat's the line, that's oh. get dangerous. I used to I used to say say that, it, and that's when my parents would know something bad was going to go down. When I'd be like, "Let's get dangerous." <laughs> <Uh-oh>. <laughs> All right, what book would you recommend our audience? Hey. So, a book that that really influenced me in my own journey of knowledge. In fact, I would say if I had to say one book that kind of changed my entire trajectory in seeking knowledge, uh, it would be the book uh, Wabil Sayyib uh, by uh, Imam Ibn Qayyim. <laughs> Uh, I'm doing an explanation of that right now. What's that? <laughs> I'm doing an explanation of that right now. Oh no way! Subhanallah. Well, is it yeah. online? Can people attend? Can we put the link in the in the chat? No, you don't have to. It's, it's, yeah, Subhanallah. I always have it with me. It's just a it's a tahdeeb. It's a mufassar, but it's uh yeah. Yeah. So it's also translated in English as uh, the invocation of God. And the reason why this book uh, really changed my life uh, is because prior to that. You know, I used to think of knowledge as just a collection of information, facts of um, this scholar said this, this scholar said that. Uh, but when you read that book, it shows you how the most fundamental concepts in Islam, like dhikrullah, remembrance of God, how that is a paradigm and an entire worldview in and of itself. It's a, it's a, it's a different psychology. It explains to you the psychology of dhikr. And one of the things that blew my, uh, blew my mind when I was reading the book is how uh, Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim talks about how our spirituality, our remembrance of Allah, our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can alter the way that we perceive reality, right? So there's a, mm-hmm. uh, a famous hadith in which, uh, hadith Qudsi, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, when a servant be- becomes beloved to me, then I become uh, the, the sight with which he sees, the hearing with which he hears, right? And the scholars of Islam have mentioned this is the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that transforms a person's uh, sensory faculties. And that led me to this concept of, that's how I came up with the concept of spiritual perception. And I created this, this website uh, just about, you know, explaining Islam, uh, explaining the philosophy of Islam or the worldview of Islam uh, and how the fundamental Islamic concepts provide a meaningful explanation of reality and answer uh, the big questions of life. Uh, and so that really was a, a, a big change for me, reading reading uh, Ibn al-Qayyim's work. Yeah, Risala Tabukiya did it for me. Like when I was a new Muslim, that yeah. changed my whole, like under, like understanding the Sunnah. This is the portion of yes. Hijrah to Allah and Hijrah to his messenger. Right. Uh, it just blew me away. That really just, that really made me want to study the deen. Yeah, yeah subhanAllah. And it's always interesting to go back to those works and see that that big picture, right? When we get lost in the details and you, you just go back and you see the big picture of things. Yes, yeah, let's, let's get to some audience questions, inshallah. I thought this is a good one for you. <laughs> this person says, hello, if you see this, please explain how a God could possibly exist. What is the proof of his existence? Do you have proof of it? I know, Dr. Nazar, you've written a lot on this topic. I'm not sure if you can provide it in a quick response, but... Yeah, yeah. so... No, JazakAllah khair. So uh, there's an article that I wrote for Yaqeen Institute called Atheism and Radical Skepticism. And uh, and it's talking about Ibn Taymiyyah's uh, explanations of the topic, but there's many other scholars who have made similar points as well. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting is uh, when we make this... When we say, prove to me that God exists, uh, we have certain assumptions that go into that statement, right? What is proof? What constitutes proof? 
So there was um, a debate uh, once where an uh, atheist was asked, you know, what would convince you that God exists? Uh, what kind of proof are you looking for? And he said, I've I will only believe in God if I see him directly. And then the person asked him, well, even if you see him directly, would you then believe in him? He, he thought about it for a second and he said, well, actually, I would probably think I'm having a bad hangover, right? And that's something the Quran actually alludes to this phenomenon, which is radical skepticism. Right? And the Quran says uh, in, in Surah Al-Hijr, for example, وَلَوْ فَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ بَابًا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَظَلُّوا فِيهِ يَعْرُجُونَ لَقَالُوا إِنَّمَا سُكِّرَتْ أَبْصَارُنَا بَلْ نَحْنُ قَوْمٌ مَسْحُورُونَ If you were, if they were to see... Um, the gates of the heavens opened up and they were to, were to see the angels ascend up into the gates or in another tafsir, they, they ascended up into the gates. They would still say that our, we are hallucinating. Someone has bewitched our eyesight, right? So they would still find reason to deny. So the question is, um, you know, uh, if, if somebody were to ask you, prove to me that you exist, why do you take that for granted, right? There's an entire philosophy called solipsism, which is that nothing exists other than my mind, right? Uh, and this idea that you could be in a matrix or a brain in a vat and everything that you're seeing is just fed to you by chemicals. Now, you're not in any state of doubt about this and wondering, how do I know if that's true or not? Can somebody give me proof? Uh, so you, you take all of your reality as meaningful because you believe that it, reality exists. In the same way, um, in order for existence itself to have any meaning, uh, we have to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the proof is therefore all around us. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the end of Surah Yusuf, How many are, how numerous are the signs in the heavens and the earth that they walk right past and they turn away from them, right? So the signs are there, the proofs are there. The question is, do we have the right mindset uh, to recognize proof? And for more details, refer to the article. <laughs> no, it's so true. Now everybody keeps saying, oh, how do you know we're not in a simulation? Like, which I guess another word for the matrix. But. Yeah, and that's, that's another interesting concept. Uh, you know, uh, this, the, the idea of a simulation, uh, when, you, when people talk about how the universe could be uh, a, a computer simulation generated by a uh, advanced alien civilization and then yeah. or some advanced being and then uh, somebody asks them well what if you you call the being who who created this universe god and they're like well <laughs> and this was actually asked one of these popular atheists and he's like well i guess i guess you could right so he's like well, you're willing to uh, conceive of these elaborate scenarios to get out of something that's really simple which is that you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, right? How can you disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you didn't exist, you were in a state of death, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought you into life. Allah brought you from non-existence into existence. And that's only meaningful, uh, you know, through the Islamic worldview. It's so true. The other thing is like, they'll be, they'll be like, <clears throat> oh, it's, the universe has been around. So they just like take the, like there's no such thing as God, but the universe has been around forever. Which I know is a different point, but it's almost like they take the attributes of God and then they just attribute it to the universe. You know, like if the universe wants me to have this, I'm praying for the universe to give me this. And it's just they just replace God with the universe, but it's still in essence. Yeah, that that's way. especially <laughs> become common now. Uh, you know, with yeah. people talk about how uh, with with the rise of atheism, decline of traditional forms of religion, people are still just as uh, you know, religion seeking, uh, but mm -hmm. they're creating new forms of new age spirituality where they say things like sending positive vibes instead of sending <laughs> prayers, right? Or say, you know, I, uh, the universe manifested this in my life instead of saying that Allah blessed me with this. So it's interesting to use all these substitutions and, you know, they say, what is the universe trying to tell me? I'm trying to figure out, well, the universe is not trying to tell you anything, right? The universe is just particles. It's a creation. It's makhluk, right? It's the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you, you really can't escape that. You can't escape the fact that consciousness is there and that uh, the, the, the one who, who created us uh, is a, the, none other than uh, the divine essence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all of his names and attributes. Okay, so this is a longer question. Uh, I'm trying to read it here. It says, a few questions for Dr. Nasser. What is um, your advice in balancing both dunya pursuits and deen and being excellent in both, inshallah? 
Uh, also, what is your response to youth nowadays who ask, how do we know Islam is the right religion? I think that's what she says. Islam is the right re religion in the midst of all other religions. Yeah, so two very different questions kind of rolled into <laughs> one there. Uh, so with, with respect to the first question, uh, balancing uh, deen and dunya pursuits, uh, it comes back to having uh, very clear goals, making a lot of dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those goals, right? You're not asking the universe to manifest anything to, to you. You're asking the, the creator and sustainer of the heavens and the earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, to allow you to achieve those goals. And then you construct practical steps towards those goals, right? So you, you have to look at your time and you have to maximize your time according to uh, what, what your goals are and what you want to contribute to the ummah. Right. So if you're if you have all these goals, but you're spending all your time gaming and chilling and doing all these things, you know, one of the things I realized in my own journey is if I hadn't used the time that I had in high school to read, you know, books nonstop, there's no way I would be able to, to do what I, I'm doing now. Even if I started my journey at a later stage and was super intense about it, like at, at a university level or or wherever, I could not get to the point where I am now, it's only because I capitalize on that early amount of, uh, uh, that, er that early period in my life. So my advice to people who are in their teenage years is you don't know what opportunity you have now that you will never have again in your life. And that will determine the trajectory of your life, subhanAllah. Uh, and the scholars of Islam talked about the importance of, of time and the value of time. Uh, and that, that, and of course we know the hadith about uh, the person being asked on the day of judgment about how they spent their youth, right? So your youth, your teenage years, that will determine your trajectory in life, how you use your time in those years. Um, so that's what I would say about uh, balancing deen and dunya pursuits. In, in terms of how do we know Islam is the, the right path, it's through the Islamic worldview. It's not, you don't need to go to some complicated external proof here or there. The message of Islam is the only way to make sense of the big questions of life. Um, so every single human being has certain questions about life, uh, spiritual questions like, why do I exist? What is the purpose of life? Wh why does my existence matter? Uh, and then there are moral questions, like how do I live a good life, right? There are intellectual questions, like, uh, you know, uh, wh why does... Uh, why does the universe exist, right? What is, what is the point behind existence as a whole? What is the, the point of my faculty of reasoning? Right? Why is my reasoning able to understand and discover truths about the universe? So you have these spiritual, intellectual, moral dimensions of, of life. The beauty of Islam is that those are all answered in the fundamental message of Islam, in the message of Tawheed, right? So Tawheed empowers the human being by giving us a worldview where we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created you for a purpose. You use your, your, your mind, your faculty of reasoning to understand the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in nature and in scripture. You use your, uh, your uh, human uh, capacities to, uh, to take on moral duties, to take care of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to strive to achieve moral excellence. Everything fits together, and all of that goes to the, back to the spiritual path of coming closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the Quran, "Fabi hadithin yu'minun." In what narrative are they going to believe in after this, right? And people have searched, you know, looked at different uh, narratives, looked at different ideologies, uh, but there's a reason why today, in an age where religion is in decline. Uh, Islam remains the most religious religion in the sense that Muslims have, a, uh, have this zeal and commitment and passion about their religion that other people find somewhat strange. They, you know, people who take their religion as just a cultural label. Um, because Islam is something that sits at the core of a person's heart, right? And sits at the core of a person's soul and informs their entire worldview. Um, so that's that, understanding the Islamic message. The more you understand it, uh, the more you increase in your uh, certainty, in your yaqeen. All right, this is the last question, inshallah. How do you maintain hijab while practicing medicine as a woman? I know this might be difficult, but I thought, given your medical background, inshallah, you might have some insight. Yes, yeah, subhanAllah, it's an interesting question because 
uh, I believe it was just last year, there was um, a big controversy in Canada where some uh, someone published a a very Islamophobic uh, um, article in Canadian Medical Association uh, Journal, uh, you know, be, because there was a, a, a Muslim girl with hijab on, on the cover of one journal. Somebody wrote a, uh, a letter, a physician wrote a letter actually with all sorts of ridiculous Islamophobic remarks like uh, people who wear hijab can't ride bicycles and they can't like really nutty things. And it's crazy that it was actually published. But um, in response to that, a lot of Muslim physicians felt compelled to, to write about uh, the experience of Islamophobia, even in the medical profession. My mother actually wrote, uh, you know, her experience as a, as a Muslim medical doctor wearing hijab and seeing Islamophobic remarks from some of her colleagues. So yes, there is going to be uh, you know, negative pressures and those things uh, exist in, in the medical profession, which is very unfortunate because you're treating patients. So you have to put those biases and prejudices at the door. How are you going to treat a, a patient from Muslim background? And you have these, you know, backwards, ignorant kind of uh, Islamophobic uh, ideas about Muslims. It's, it's ridiculous, but unfortunately uh, it exists. Um, so for, for Muslims, one of the best things that you can do to support uh, your uh, other Muslim colleagues is, is be proud of your identity. Be confident in, in your identity. Uh, when you, you know, don't be shy about uh, requests for religious accommodations. Don't be shy about, ex uh, you know, ex expressing to your colleagues and explain to them your, uh, the religious celebrations that, uh, uh, that we have. You know, when it's interesting, whenever I was on call at the hospital on uh, over the Christmas uh, holidays, right? I, throughout my residency, it'd always be funny that day on the 25th of December when you're on call at the hospital, every single uh, medical service that calls you, it's, it's like, yes, this is Khalid from cardiology. Yes, this is Abdullah from orthopedics. This, and every single person in the hospital that day is, is Muslim, right? Because it's the Muslims who are running the whole entire hospital so that their colleagues are able to go on, on their holiday and vacation. It, that just goes unappreciated, right? Um, you know, there's not, there's barely a, there's barely a hospital uh, without uh, Muslim physicians on staff or Muslim nurses or, or, or other healthcare workers. So um, it's not like it used to be where, where Muslims were uh, still, you know, a minority. Uh, there's the Muslim presence is there. So be confident in, in your identity, inshallah. inshallah. We're going to end on that question, but then another question came in. I think you might know the questioner. So. <laughs> we'll, we'll take this, <laughs> inshallah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, Amana Fitness, uh, shout out to my sister, Amina. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people think her name is Amana because it's called Amana Fitness, but her name's Amina, Amina Khan. So uh, any interesting shifts you noticed in Dawa culture over the past 15 years? Um, I would say that there have been some uh, positives and, and some negatives. So I would say that uh, the negatives uh, have been predominantly with the social media uh, generation, people being very much oriented towards uh, clickbaity, viral kind of content that is just about refutation, uh, out expressing outrage over things, you know, going back to uh, my, my earlier comments. Uh, and people have lost the, the, the passion to just explain things to, so that somebody understands a topic, right? Don't worry about refuting this person or that person or trying to get more followers and, and, and trying to uh, cloud chasing, right? That's the other term for it. Uh, just focus on how you can help others understand the deen. Uh, that's that's the, the first thing. And then the, the positive though, uh, in terms of the, the Dawah culture is we have at our disposal more resources today than has ever been available in the history of Islam. And that's something really remarkable, right? The idea that you can search uh, the entire literary corpus of a scholar like Imam Ibn al-Qayyim in just a few seconds. No scholar, previous scholar had access to that. The idea you can search all of the works of hadith on your computer, right? On, from your phone, from your smartphone. Uh, it's an incredible amount of resources. Um, the, the computer resources we have is incredible. So we have those resources but all of a sudden, we've lost even basic literacy in our own tradition. And, and people, I think people in the Dawah uh, culture get a lot of zeal for going out there and getting exposure without first solidifying their knowledge. And really, if you're going to spend time out there doing Dawah, I would say that 10% of the time uh, should be in, in your uh, output. 90% of your time should be focusing on developing yourself. Absolutely. 
Yeah, I mean, subhanAllah, with the with the emergence of the information, they say the cost of information is attention. So mm -hmm. knowing how to, where to put your attention. But then now you see with this, uh, this is a whole conversation, different separate conversation with chat GPT, what's going to take Yeah, <laughs> Especially with research, you know. We've got right our templates being generated. Yeah, Allah Allah. Yes. Allah. <laughs> Jazakallah khair, Dr. Nazir, for your time and for all the amazing insight that you gave us, alhamdulillah. It's great having you and uh, inshallah we hope to have you back soon, bi-idhnillah. Maybe we can talk about chat GBT more. It's always a, a pleasure and jazakallah khair, you guys. Inshallah, we'll be back with Sincerely Yours, not next Wednesday, but the Wednesday after, inshallah. And inshallah, Dr. Ruhi Tahir will be our guest uh, that that week, inshallah. So we hope to see you all then, peedinillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.